Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Jewish Gen Talk with Dr. Joel Weintraub. We're going to get started in just a couple of moments as people log in. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Jewish Gen Talk with Dr. Joel Weintraub. We'll be talking about Manifest Destiny, names at Ellis Island. People are still logging in, and we will get started in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Jewish Gen Talk with Dr. Joel Weintraub about Manifest Destiny names at Ellis Island. People are still logging in. We will get started in just a moment. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Jewish Gen Talks with Dr. Joel Weintraub. People are still logging in. We are aiming to get started in just a moment. Thank you for your patience. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's Jewish Gen Talk with Dr. Joel Weintraub. Our topic for today is Manifest Destiny, Names at Ellis Island. We are very glad that you are with us and glad that you are participating in this Jewish Gen Talk series of webinars, whereby we connect you with Jewish genealogical experts from around the world in an effort to better educate ourselves about how we can learn more about the experiences that our families, about the experience of our families. Um, Dr. Weintraub is an award-winning professor emeritus at California State University, Fullerton. He's the creator of search tools for the U.S. and New York City sentences via stevemorris.org. He's currently developing locational tools for the 2022 release of the 1950 federal census. Perhaps most importantly, he's a volunteer and has submitted a number of articles and info files at Jewish Gen. We are very, very glad and grateful that he's giving this webinar today. Just a couple of notes of how we will proceed. Uh, in a moment, Dr. Weintraub will give his own introduction and explain uh, the format of today's webinar. As we go along, you are able to post uh, questions in the Q&A box uh, on the bottom of the screen. And then after the presentation, Dr. Weintraub will go through them and answer the questions. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will also give a little bit of information about upcoming talks. I also would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Orange County Jewish Genealogical Society, um, for making this presentation possible. And without any further ado, Dr. Joel Weintraub. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to Southern California and my walk-in closet office. I prepared a 47 and a half minute narrated PowerPoint presentation, but I've had trouble with being kicked out of Zoom. So I've given Avrami the file to run. And uh, you might ask, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my time here staring at me? So I have some, I have some choices here. I could, uh, I could just look look intelligent, see, I could look intelligent, or I could um, decide to proof my own talk, or I could maybe take a nap, that's a possibility. But for those of you who know me and know my talks, you know that I talk from exhibits. And I have selected a whole bunch of exhibits here surrounding me um, that as the presentation will run, I'm going to show you the exhibits uh, on my own screen. And my understanding is you can change the proportion of the presenter 
uh, and the pr presentation, uh, and you could kind of diminish me so you don't even see me. And I'll be using this macro lens uh, to look up very close. So with that short introduction, you see I have a, che uh, a uh, cheat sheet of where the demonstrations are. Uh, let's see if we can run it, Avrami. Okay. All yours. Okay, thank you very, very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start the presentation. Oh, that's not to go back to the first slide. We don't want to give away too much. Wings at Ellis Island. You're looking at a postcard image of this iconic immigration structure that opened in 1900 after a fire had destroyed the previous wooden structure. Ellis Island is called the Island of Hope. It's called the Island of Tears. Lots of people went through it during its heyday, which was 1892 to 1924. It finally closed in 1954 and then fell into a state of disrepair. A private foundation was set up to uh, create funds to renovate it. And I have actually a piece of Ellis Island, a piece of tile from the uh, Great Hall. My ancestors probably walked by this piece of tile. And with that money, they renovated the building and the grounds, and it opened in 1990, uh, rededicated in 1990 to the public. 70% of immigrants went through Ellis Island during this period of time. And I've seen this quote, although I'm not sure what it's based on, that it's been estimated that close to 40% of all current U.S. citizens can trace at least one of their ancestors to Ellis Island. I've always been interested in this immigration station and have put up two info files on Jewish Gen, one on finding difficult to find people on uh, Ellis Island Manifest, and the other one on the Ellis Island name change myth. The question I want to address is were immigrant family names changed often intentionally by Ellis Island officials? The present consensus is it did not happen. However, if you were to look at your genealogy books from 40 years ago, the answer was, yes, it happened quite frequently. There is a interesting 2018 book by historian Kirsten Fermiglish called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name that goes through the name change patterns of Jews in the United States and that she feels very strongly that they did it themselves, not Ellis Island. Look at the paper trail. That was my strategy to get a handle on the name change belief. And during this talk, I'm going to show you three shipping line documents, the manifest inspection card and landing tag, two Ellis Island lists. There were lists of names at Ellis Island detention and special inquiry. And then I'm going to tackle um, trying to find difficult passengers by looking at two manifest transcriptions, a book index, which will give us some insight into where uh, manifest changes were done and WPA cards. So let's first look at the ship manifests. They were created before the ship left port to get to the US or Canada or wherever it was going. So the port of departure is where uh, this document was created. If there are mistakes of names, they were done on that side of the ocean, not at Ellis Island. Did the immigrants see the document? Well, now, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. And I'm going to go come back to that. Did they keep the document? Absolutely not. Did they know the legality? Yes, it was a legal document. 
And the inspectors certainly knew that the document was a legal document, especially after 1906, when it was used to check uh, the, the naturalization papers of the immigrant. And we'll, get, we'll tell you more about that later. So how did the immigrant's information get on the manifest sheet? Certainly, I don't think you know, an immigrant could get up to the ticket window at Hamburg saying, you know, I see this, this ship sailing in a couple of hours. Uh, here's money for one ticket to the United States and then walk on board the ship. So there must have been some sort of mechanism to, tr to have the immigrant answer the questions on the manifest and then that was transferred into the manifest itself because the handwriting is just too good through most of these manifest pages uh, to believe it was done one at a time with the immigrant giving the information directly. I think one possible way, and I've seen this only twice, is something called a declaration form. Uh, this is one that I actually bought, a 1936 form, that mimics what's on the ship manifest. And the immigrant had to fill it out and swear an oath that the information on it was accurate. The shipping company could reject the immigrant uh, passage because if the immigrant was deported at Ellis Island, then the shipping company had to get the immigrant back to the port of departure at their own expense and also pay for meals. So that if you put on the declaration form that you were an anarchist and, be, um, and believed in, uh, and you were polygamist, I don't think you'd have much of a chance of getting a ticket to the United States. So the oath said, in part, I hereby certify that I have made true answers to the questions, including the name, which were asked in language understood by me and which answers have been recorded above. And this is uh, the, the, from a 1911 document that I had uh, uh, seen on an auction site. My 1936 form warned the immigrant that a false oath will subject the passenger to fine or imprisonment. So it's a legal document, they knew it. However, if you look at a ship manifest, you will see corrections on it. I don't go as far as saying name changes, but you will see a number of corrections. What, when, where did they uh, happen, those corrections? Did they happen at the Great Hall? So here's the Great Hall. Uh, uh, there weren't that many pictures of the actual immigrants versus the immigration inspectors. And the immigration inspectors are on the left. They have the ship manifest in front of them. Obviously, the immigrants can see, or can they see, the ship manifest. You notice that the inspectors are raised. The immigrants appear to be looking up at them. Uh, it would be very difficult to actually see the manifest. And if you think about it, um, what, why would the shipping company use the manifest except for this main purpose? So I'm not so sure that this wasn't the first time they actually saw this document that they had submitted information uh, to. You see, they all have uh, landing tags on them except for one individual, this one here, and he's a translator. And there's one translator for every two inspectors. There's another picture, a side view of the same scene. And you could see that there was one of these individuals there. Um, and, the, and the inspectors themselves could speak multiple languages and they had transcribers there. So who is responsible for the accuracy of the ship manifest? And the answer is, of course, the shipping company, not the inspectors at Ellis Island. If you look at a ship manifest, the microfilm of it, you'll find, uh, I would think in each one of these, this signed document, this signed statement. And it's signed by the ship uh, master, uh, of the, in this case, it's the Mount Clay, in the presence of an immigration officer. It's a very formal document. 
And the master says, according to the best of my knowledge and belief, the information in said lists or manifests concerning each of said aliens named therein is correct and true in every respect, including their name. Lots of people had access to the manifest. They could write on it. The shipping company, officials of various sorts, federal investigators. There were some uh, fraud going on at Ellis Island. People were actually uh, cooking the records uh, and you may actually see that. There are changes though. There are alterations of the manifest. There may be cross outs, a line going all the way across. These people either didn't sail or they may have changed from third class to first class and went from one page of the manifest to another. So that's one sort of change. Another correction is fixing typos. You know, that scene of the Great Hall, I just can't picture immigration officials in that controlled chaos worrying about the, the exact name uh, on that document. I went through this ship, this is the Berengaria of 1923, and found 59 corrections on the manifest. And um, this is one type of correction in which the typist mistypes the name, putting the uh, first name of the person, not in the second column, but the first column. And so someone went through this and reversed the name. We're going to come back to this example later. Here are some more examples of this ship and the changes that were done. I don't think any of these meets this general concept of this uh, Ellis Island name change belief, where the government is forcing a name change um, to Americanize European names. Edward Luft agrees with me in this sense that he said uh, in fall of 2017 that if we define a name change as a completely different name and not just changing a letter or two, then the immigration inspectors at the port of entry never change names. And I go even farther because I would question whether the immigration inspectors even did that minimum um, letter or two change on the manifest. There are clarification possibilities that you will see. For instance, here is an Italian uh, ship and we have a bunch of people and the family name column in which a new name was put there. It's not an Americanized name. And what those people are, are married women who are using their maiden name because that was a cultural uh, thing. And somebody put down their uh, married name on that. So just because you see a different name, in a sense, this is also a correction of status. There are investigations that are shown on the manifest. And this is a very famous one in 1908, where the individual is, set, is uh, put into special inquiry and the immigration inspectors changed Woodhall to Johnson. Now, generally, you know, I would get laughs about this because this doesn't quite fit the name change belief that you're going from an unpronounceable European name to some sort of Americanized name. And here you're going from Woodhall to Johnson. Doesn't seem to uh, fit that, uh, that, that model, that idea. And they also changed this person's name from Frank to Mary. And if you look at the special inquiry page, this is a very famous case that was in the newspapers. Mary Johnson, uh, because uh, of her line of work, could not find job uh, as a woman, uh, could find it as a man, uh, was, uh, uh, had a mustache, bulky uh, frame, low voice, 
uh, found it easier to dress as a man and use the name Frank Woodhull. And so the immigration inspectors held her for a day and there was no, nothing illegal. There was nothing illegal about her use of her name. And they released her to the whatever she wanted to do in the United States. She could have used any name she wanted to after she left Ellis Island. And name changing uh, was very common. It didn't have to uh, be pinned on the inspectors at Ellis Island. There's another document, but it's based pretty much on the manifest uh, called medical cards or inspection cards required uh, by, by the US government uh, since 1894. It was done at the point of departure. Not only could the immigrants see this document, they could keep the document so that they had a representative of the name on the manifest. If the name was wrong in the manifest, it was probably wrong on the inspection card. It was a legal document in the sense that on the back uh, stamped was that they were uh, vaccinated and they needed that to get into the country. The inspectors asked for that card, stamped that card uh, as well. I'm gonna show you some uh, documents from Heinrich, a teenager coming into the US. This is stamped on the 15th of July, 1922 in Hamburg. His ship doesn't leave until the 27th. This is a disinfested card. That doesn't sound good. And then the next thing that is issued is his inspection card, official card uh, on the Mount Clay. You notice his name is now Emmerich. Emmerich also appears on his ship manifest. I'm sure I don't think that that is an error. When he does come into the US, he eventually becomes naturalized and he changes his name on the naturalization papers to Henry Ford. Here's the back of his card. You can see it's stamped vaccinated, disinfested. And I think I can blow up that. It says, keep this card to avoid detention or quarantine. And somehow on railroads in the United States. Not quite sure about that. You may see original cards uh, on auction sites. Some people put a high value on these. Some people do not. Let's look at another uh, document from the shipping company called a landing tag, which was required by law at least starting in 1903. I think they were done before departure, even though they may have been given out on the way to Ellis Island. They could see the document. Um, I'm not sure they could keep necessarily the document uh, it may have been collected because it might be part of a fraud problem if, they were, if this was uh, just given out. It's an administrative document. It's not really a legal document, although it's required by US law. And it should match the information on the manifest. Here is the, uh, a description of it from Barry Marino's Encyclopedia of Ellis Island that each immigrant received a large slip of paper, a tag, that was affixed to their coats or shirts and had to be worn in view at all times. The tag, often color-coded to indicate the steamship line, was inscribed with the manifest number of the passenger. I might mention also the line number of that sheet, the name of the steamship and the immigrant's name. Well, actually I have two in my collection. Landing cards. This one, I can't even read uh, the name of the person or the line they were on. Yeah, and there was a part of a parcel of other documents. I was really surprised to see that there. It looks certainly like a landing card. The other one is from a, uh, a bunch of Italian papers I picked up. The uh, person's first name is Corrado. And I, I felt badly about this particular purchase because I, uh, just a huge number of documents. I can't believe 
how many immigration documents there were. I tried to track down this family uh, because I asked, where did this person get all these uh, documents from? And it turned out it was a, um, a storage box sale. You know, someone doesn't pay their rent on a storage. You go and you auction off these boxes. You don't know what's in them. And that's where this particular uh, group of papers were. Maybe I'll have better luck when the 1950 census comes out to track down this uh, family. Uh, the back of this, however, doesn't have all those instructions. The back of this is, is, uh, is clear. But I certainly do think that this is also a landing card. Very, very rare to see these. There is an online website that is filled with documents, immigration documents, ship ads, ship regulations, and they have all three of what I'm talking to you about for the same individual. And her name was Barbara Vitkian. She came in 1923. Her manifest indicates that she's illiterate. So anything that's on these, she did not write. So here's the landing tag of Barbara. Show you the back, you see the bottom, it's in Hebrew, different languages. When landing at New York, this card to be attached to the code address of the passenger in a prominent position. And there is her inspection card. And you can see now on the bottom that there are punched out uh, times when the surgeon uh, of the ship checked all the passengers and you can see the stamps. What's the big five, six on these cards? Well, we can turn to the manifest, the third document for Barbara, and we find out that on sheet five or page five, or they call it list five, we go down and look and find out that line six is where she is located, line six. So that every person on this ship has a unique address. And that unique address is shown uh, on the manifest where she is located and on the other two documents as well. So it would be really difficult and, and the immigrant inspector would know this, that, that they have three different documents all with the same person's name. Well, why are you gonna change a person's name when the name is on these documents? All of them, I think, made in the port, the port of departure. If you compare the landing tag on the top and the medical card, which I know was made in uh, initially in the port, the port of departure, I think that the handwriting uh, is the same, that the person who did this did both of these cards at the same time. And here is a, a, a very, I think, famous photograph of a blended family. Yeah, usually only the head of the family was given the landing tag. But in this case, all the kids were, were given it. Uh, you can track down this, this family uh, because there's some newspaper articles about it. And so one of the family change stories is that the inspector, and here is Inspector Weintraub, dressed up in my simulation costume. I give um, uh, Ellis Island simulations, or I used to. This pandemic is not going to be kind to me on this uh, situation. And I'm asking, what's your name? And you know the, the nature of stories. Uh, the um, inspector says to the immigrant, what's your name? He doesn't understand the question. He answers, uh, I come from Berlin. Uh, the inspector says, your name must be Berlin. And the person's name becomes Berlin. Well, the inspector doesn't have to ask what's your name. Your name is on your chest, right there. So one idea is they're asking what's your name to check your hearing and speech. It was very well thought out, the routine that inspectors use for immigrants. For instance, that, that inspection card. When you go to Ellis Island, the person, the public health service person says, I want to see your card. I'm going to stamp it. They stamp the card, and then they look at you. You don't know they're looking at you. If you look too closely at that card, you peer at that card, what did that stamp mean? They're going to chalk you with an E, which means that 
you may have bad eyesight and later on the line, someone will see that chalk mark and pull you out and do some further medical tests on you. So um, immigrant names are put on lists at Ellis Island. Some people say that did not happen, it did happen. And the two ones I wanna talk about are the detention and the Board of Special Inquiry pages. So we'll go through the same sort of process here that these forms were made at Ellis Island. I'm not sure if the immigrants uh, were able to see these. Um, they obviously did not keep them. They're administrative forms. I don't know where the lists were derived from, whether they were done directly from the manifest, which I don't think happened, or some other intermediate document. But one would expect that the name on the list should match the name on the manifest. 80% of immigrants that went through Ellis Island went through without a problem at all. 12% were held temporarily. Um, they didn't have money to proceed. They had to uh, send out a telegram. Someone wasn't there to pick them up and they had to be held for a brief period of time. 6% of the immigrants, um, the inspectors suspected that something was wrong. They could be a likely public charge. They could be uh, a contract laborer, which was illegal. And of those 6%, one third of them uh, on average were deported. About 2% of the people coming into Ellis Island were deported. It's those two, those two that lists were made uh, as uh, of the immigrants. And about one out of six then are on these immigrant uh, lists. They're bundled with the manifest starting from the early 1900s. So if your uh, relative came in 1895, uh, you don't expect to see this. And you know that they're on this list because they have uh, symbols next to the front of their names. X's for detention and SI for special inquiry. Here's an example of a record of detained aliens. My grandmother is actually on this sheet. You see there's lots of information, the cause of detention, who picked them up, their address, um, the um, uh, number of meals they had at Ellis Island, some, some really neat stuff here. And here is the Board of Special Inquiry list, nicely typed. Uh, less information to some extent. There's a column there. You can just make it out maybe CL, contract laborer, likely public charge, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, the discharge information. This is one ship and it goes on and on and on. Only one person on this page was uh, deported. My great grandfather is on this page. Uh, I come from a long history of people who are held for investigation obviously. Now I want to make a point here, an aside here about these uh, detention and special inquiry pages. Someone comes up to me and says, you know, I found my person uh, on these pages coming through Ellis Island and that's it. There's not much else that I have. And I say to them, um, no, no, uh, you probably got this information from Ancestry.com because they transcribed the detention and special inquiry images, but the Ellis Island database itself did not, did not. And you should know that these pages show the page and line number of the passenger on the manifest. And this is one of the examples I used in another paper, although I'm gonna use Meyer uh, later on. And here is their, like, is their uh, special inquiry page. They're on sheet nine, line 26 and 27. If you go back to the manifest, you can find where they are. You can find that manifest sheet. And you would be surprised because my Schlachter, his name doesn't appear on the microfilm version. It's been ripped off. There are ways of finding people whose name no longer appears on the manifest, um, uh, the microfilm version of it. 
So what I did with these forms is I was curious to find out how accurate the detention and special inquiry names are versus the manifest. And I found out that type misspellings were fairly common. But again, I don't know where these lists came from. To show you some examples, here's Shmuel, who now has an E added to his name. Left is the manifest, right is the detention pages or special inquiry. Here we have Moshe Hachman. I think he has two N's on his last name. Now he has only one N. Here we have Alexander Refna. He now has a nickname, Alex. Maybe that is an Americanizing. And here we have Josepha with a Z, and she becomes Josepha with an S. But certainly none of the names I looked at were completely changed names. They're all recognizable in terms of what their manifest name was. Okay, for the remaining uh, 15 or so minutes, if I can squeeze it in, I wanna tell you something about ship manifest and how to find difficult passengers. And I'm going to tell you about something you may not have worked with, which will give us insight into changes on the manifest as well. And those are called book indexes. There are 870 films, and they start, they start in 1906. So remember the starting date. So if you have a 1905 um, ship arrival, you're not going to see it on this book index. From the encyclopedia, Quote, the boarding inspectors were given a handwritten copy of the ship's passenger list, not the manifest, that had been prepared in advance by the steamship's purser and his assistants. So the U.S. inspectors were given two documents. They were given the manifest and they were given this copy of the passenger list. And a purser, I had to look this up, a purser is an officer on the ship, the head steward and his assistants. So these index books were made after the manifest was created on the ship before the US immigration officials got it. This is what they look like. This is not an index book. Um, I paid high value for this. This is an 1892 uh, ship manifest of people coming in from Rotterdam. Uh, very nice. Uh, uh, I did it for uh, exhibition purposes. The difference between this and an index book is that an index book has on the left side the sheet and line number of the person. It's an index book. And this is how it's used. Starting in 1906, when you applied for naturalization, you had to, add, you had to show when, how, and where you came in. And a person went and looked at the ship manifest. It's in 14,000 volumes. Remember, starting in 1906. And issue what's called a certificate of arrival. Well, what the book index does is it speeds up the process. So instead of going directly to the ship manifest, the inspectors went to the book because the book tells you where they are on the ship manifest. They don't have to go page by page and it speeds up the process dramatically. There's lots of people who can't find their individuals uh, on ship manifest because it's shown on the naturalization paper, but the ship came in before 1906. There's no certificate of arrival and they could have put down anything. Uh, and most of those pre-1906 arrivals, post-1906 naturalization papers were not checked to see if that ship actually was what they came in on. So the book indexes were done after the manifest was created and after the ship had left port. There are apparently no crossed out passenger names shown. It has a lot of names here, over 7.5 million names. Now I'm gonna make a statement here. Um, I think that actually a lot more research is needed with a lot of different examples, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and I think we need something dramatic here. So let's, 
Ah, that's dramatic. That most manifest name corrections, I believe, were done by the shipping company and not by immigration inspectors at Ellis Island. Well, let's go back to this example here. Which spelling appears on the book index? The original manifest name indicating the correction was done at Ellis Island. In other words, the listing under T for uh, Thomas, it should be under K, or the corrected name indicating the correction was made after the manifest was created and before Ellis Island inspectors took possession of the manifest. So, manual, uh, the uh, index book's not complete, we can eliminate him. The other three, the book index shows the corrected name, shows the corrected name. These corrections were done before Ellis Island. Where the manifest corrections were actually done in the cases I'm showing you is not clear. The errors may have been corrected before the ship left port. Now, I'm not gonna show you the, how to search the films directly on Family Search is where they are, but I do want to tell you about the name index that they have for the books. Remember, 1906. I'm going to use this example of a certificate of arrival from Hillel Wolozinski. He came in 1907 on the Estonia, and I'm going to paste that information on the upper right. I go into the Family Search New York Book Indexes, remember 1906. Uh, there's lots of stuff in the bottom that doesn't pertain. They must have glued in their database into an existing template. Uh, I could use Haley Wolozinski or use a wild card. There's only one Haley Wolozinski that came through Ellis Island. And voila, there he is, Haley Wolozinski. Uh, there's a summary and a uh, an image. If I look at the summary, it says Hillel came in in 1908 on the Trieste. Uh, no, no, that's not right. And I've seen this again and again and again. There's a mislinking. If you view the original document, even from this page here, you see in blue there, view the original document, I'm on the right page because you can just make out Hillel. But now I see on the top about this roller man that is from 1907. And I can work my way back in the images to the first page, the first, which is the cover of the book. And if I go back to the cover of the book, and there it is, the Estonia in 1907. Came in a little bit earlier than uh, the, uh, uh, the, yeah, August 29th date up there. I think the difference may be 1907 was really busy and the ship may have been in port for a while waiting to unload passengers. Let's look at the second one, the WPA card files. In 1938 to 1943, the Work Progress Administration transcribed index cards directly from the manifest. Those ship manifests at Ellis Island were filmed in 1943 and 44, and were destroyed in 1948. In fact, they were given away basically for, for pulp, and the federal government got about $1,200 for all of that paper. Gary Mokotov wrote this in 2001, that the, uh, there's every evidence is that the accuracy of surnames on the microfilm, the WPA cards, index is considerably superior to the accuracy of surnames on the Ellis Island database that had just been released online in 2001. One possibility is they were transcribed directly from the manifest, avoiding problems with microfilm legibility. Another is that the New York-based transcribers were more familiar with European names. However, I'm gonna show you an even more important advantage in a second. They're on the Family Search website. If you go to the page that the index is on for these films, 
you find out that this particular page has a tremendous number of, uh, of documents. And the first problem you may be faced with is that your web browser may fail you. You may see a script problem. Um, you may stop the script and then find out that uh, there's garbage on the page. Um, solution is to use a faster web browser. The series is divided into two parts, 1897 to 1902, which is searchable by last name of immigrant, last name of immigrant. And this is a version of the role. So I come here to T519, I'm on the Family Search website. I see they're all digitized. And I look for wine trap. And I find out wine trap is in 1112, but the link is not 1112. The link actually is 113. You gotta be careful. So they mislink that. I then try and find where the first wine trap card is. There are 18,000 images here. I find the first card at the 16th 105 image. I expect 16106 to be wine trap. It's not, it's Gottfried Weissar. Duh. The next image is a wine trap image. Getting the headache yet? Now, I was able to get a surplus set of these films, believe it or not, and I have handheld tools to search and photograph microfilm. So I'm going to show you what's going on. If you look at the actual film, it's an eight millimeter film, the cards go up one side and then go upside down opposite the other side in order of their last name. So if I take a picture of my film, I have Abe Weintraub, Abram, Adolf. It could go up the alphabet, it could go up the age groups. I don't see Gottfried. If I look at the other side, there is Gottfried. That's crazy. How did they photograph this film? How did they digitize it? How did they put things upside down? And the net result is that you have a run of cards. Wine traps are going up the alphabet. Weissar is going down the alphabet. I mean, you can visualize this better with a, uh, a deck of cards. That's just crazy. And a lot of people give up on this film. And note, the first sequence of images on the film may look correct because they're unmatched. And if you want to start looking at the film, go to, go to number 5,000 and then go to 5,001 and then see where you are in the film and whether the film shows this pattern. The second sequence is 1902 to 1943. And this you look up by Soundex. I was concerned for a while that these films, uh, the second set, were not being digitized, but on May 30th, as you can see, it jumped from 14 digitized rolls to 516. So, what's another advantage? So, here is uh, a ship in which shows a lot of degradation, as you can see. It's on the bottom left side. I call it the RIP zone. And approximately 5%, according to an essay, of the sheets are torn or crumpled or otherwise damaged, one out of 20. So here I am holding um, a facsimile page from the ship. The ship is one of four in a volume, uh, 400 pages. It probably weighs at least 50 pounds. And so you can see why this very brittle paper being turned from the bottom left corner, a very heavy volume, uh, has so much ripping damage on the name column. The question is going to be this. My example is Maya Schlachter. He's on this page, 9, line 27. That's where he's hiding. 
does he have a card? If he has a, if he, if the damage was done before the WPA cards were transcribed, he doesn't have a, a uh, WPA card. If on the other hand, luckily, somehow the damage was done after this period of time, but before the ship was, was filmed, he does have a card. Does he have a card? Yes. That was a surprise. He's on, you can see, 927. So there's his address. There's the ship name, et cetera, et cetera. Let me show you an even more unbelievable one. Second example. And by the way, these were laminated. Um, this is a laminated uh, two page, two pieces, so that when they looked at the next page, you're looking at the back of these in the exact same order. And here I find, I look for a person who's on this page, who's on the Board of Special Inquiry sheet. I find that Gitto Grimm is on this sheet. And I think you can see she's right here. And she has a card. She has a card. So apparently most of the manifest damage occurred late 1939 to early 1940s. What's the reason for this? My reason is that on September 3rd, 1939, war broke out in Europe. And that had a major impact on the aliens in the United States. And by September 16th, 90,000 people had applied for citizenship papers, swamped the office, uh, hired new people, naturalization office. 1940, 500,000 people. It was also a passage of something in alien registration law. You have something like that probably in a post office. And uh, I may, uh, if I had time, I would show you uh, what, what that meant. So we have followed the paper trail. We have looked at three documents, two lists at Ellis Island, and I threw in uh, two important sources you should know about. And I haven't come across anything uh, that would tend to support a name change belief here or the opportunity of doing that as well. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about is that I have a number of my genealogy talks on YouTube and my channel is JDW Talks. And there I have my, uh, my census talks are there and uh, a couple of Ellis Island talks. One of those talks is gonna be that's there is the short history of Ellis Island. The Manifest Destiny talk would be put there within a day or two, along with the Ellis Island simulation for societies. The other two talks that you see are going to be uh, given at the uh, virtual conference of IAJGS in August, and they will be in the vault until then. And then after the conference, I'm going to put them on my, my channel. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for coming. Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to our moderator. Okay. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, we do have a question to try to get through over the next few minutes. Um, Dr. Wanchab, are you ready to field a few of them? I'm still here. I'm live. All right, we're just looking. A number of people sent me um, questions earlier, and I should have saved the ones that I could answer, but I answered all of them. So we'll okay. see what's new here. I have a double monitor in front of me, by the way, too. So if I'm looking that way, it's one monitor, and this way is the other, and the webcam is there. Uh, here's a question. A relative arrived at, in 1897. Uh, the, ship name on her, the ship name is on her naturalization petition. 
We cannot learn who she traveled with because many manifest pages were severely damaged. Is there any other way to recreate that page? See, the problem is that Ellis Island had a fire um, and uh, the fire basically burned down the original um, uh, manifest. There was a duplicate set, but not has as much material uh, that was in the old barge office in Manhattan. And so it would have been great if, they, we, if you had both of those documents. You do not. We do not have those documents. And uh, she's just going to have to find an alternate source. It's not going to be coming from manifests. Would someone be detained if the address they said they were going to did not match the address of the person who came to pick them up? No, they're not going to. Well, they would be detained anyway, because uh, it, it, it's not a question of what the address is. If no one showed up, they would be detained. And it's possible uh, on one case I've worked on where a brother came to pick him up while the cousin was on the, uh, uh, the uh, manifest itself. So that doesn't have anything to do with it. The detention is because uh, there was a mix up somewhere. They, nobody was there to pick them up uh, and they had to have someone there to pick them up. So the address is uh, not important. Okay. It's neat information to see the address, because then you can do things like look on, on a census and find people by address. So, um, you know, genealogy is a lot about addresses, not just people, but addresses. Are there naturalization petitions available online? You can find them on Family Search and also on Ancestry. Uh, a number of them are uh, indexed. There is a book, if I could find it, that I highly recommend if they're not online. And that is this Naturalization Records of the United States. And it, w it will tell you where all the records are and what the courts are, etc. So if you have trouble, I would highly recommend that book. Um, we will look for one more question. It's good that I have a real background here, not a, and I can actually find a book sometimes. Okay, there are a number of questions about um, prior to Ellis Island, if you have any advice on that. Well, I got, I had got a bunch on that. Before, before Ellis Island, remember Ellis Island is 1892. Um, there was a period of two years before that, and then it was mostly Castle Garden. And it turns out that Castle Gardens was a, uh, was a mess. In fact, It was such a mess that you have this. Graphic. And it's entitled America's hearty welcome to the innocent immigrant and everybody is fleecing them, including the people at Castle Garden. Is that one of the reasons why they put it on Ellis Island so that the immigrants would be as far away from Manhattan and New York as uh, New York City as they could? So the answer is Steve Morse does have a uh, search engine from 1820 to I think 1857, the white pages that does cover uh, New York arrivals during that period of time. But it's difficult and the records aren't the same sort of quality as Ellis Island. Okay, thank you very much. We're at the four o'clock mark here in New York. I'd like to thank you very, very much um, for this presentation. We've gotten a lot of nice feedback. Um, a couple of notes. Uh, number one is that this uh, presentation will be, the recording of it will be available on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash jewishgen.org. And we will also put it up on our YouTube page uh, today within the next couple of hours. Um, I will note for those particularly who are listening on Facebook, 
we did experience some technical issues with uh, people who uh, couldn't log into the webinar because we were at max capacity. Um, we will make the recording available as soon as possible, as mentioned. And for future talks, we will increase the capacity. We apologize for any difficulties getting on to today's presentation. Uh, speaking of Steve Morse, next week's Jewish Gen Talk will be given by Dr. Stephen Morse. His topic will be from DNA to genetic genealogy, everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask. And we encourage all of you to participate on, on that and to register in advance. Um, like I mentioned, we will be increasing capacity to make sure that everyone is able to get in. Um, and we thank you again, Dr. Weintraub, very, very much for participating in our Jewish Gen Talk series and for this very informative talk. And thank you all for spending some time with us today. And we wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. Take care.